when I arrived in Thailand, I was an illegal migrant worker. But even though I work in a factory, I read news every day. I read about the minimum wage. I read about eight-hour working hour and how much workers should get paid for overtime. Hello and welcome. My name is Judy Gearhart, and this is the LaborLink podcast, where we share the personal stories and analysis of the brave individuals organizing workers in global supply chains. This podcast is a collaboration between Empathy Media Lab and the Accountability Research Center. I'm your host, and our producer is Evan Matthew Papp. To hear other great podcasts about workers' rights, go to laborradionetwork.org. I'm excited to share this interview with Ang Cha from the Migrant Worker Rights Network in Thailand. This is a group that has pioneered new approaches in the fight to end human trafficking and forced labor. It's our second episode about migrant worker abuses in the Thai seafood industry, building on our first podcast with Ang Cha's longtime collaborator, Sawit Kavan, a national leader in the Thai trade union movement who is now facing criminal charges for his organizing. Migrant workers often endure wage theft, physical abuse, and horrible working conditions. Many of them are victims of human trafficking or debt bondage, having paid labor brokers to secure their job abroad. Here, Ang Cha talks about how migrant workers in Thailand are organizing and standing up to that abuse. I especially love how Ang Cha's story echoes that of immigrant organizers in the U.S. labor movement, like Mother Jones, a famous organizer with the United Mine Workers, to whom I'm personally grateful. You see, my grandfather was a stonemason from Italy. He was also a coal miner who died of black lung disease. Thanks to the union, however, my grandmother received additional funds through the Black Lung Benefits Act that helped her stay in the house my grandfather had renovated, the same house where I spent many holidays throughout my childhood. In this interview, Ang Cha talks about how he brought his determination and organizing skills with him after having to flee Myanmar. Our interpreter goes by the name of Job. She's a Thai national who collaborates frequently with MWRN. Hello, Ang Cha. It's really good to see you. It's been a very long time. And Job, thank you so much for interpreting for us. I really appreciate it. So, Ang Cha, can you tell us how you came to Thailand and later joined the Migrant Worker Rights Network? <laughs> I arrived in Thailand in 1988. I worked first when I arrived in Thailand in a shrimp peeling shed. So you arrived in Thailand and you started working in a shrimp peeling shed. What led you to leave Myanmar? And what were the conditions like when you came to live in Thailand? How hard was that? At the time, you know, in 1988, there was the military in power, and I joined the struggle against the military in um, 1988. At the time, the military regime donated the country, and people were not happy. I was an, an activist, and I participate and lead the protest every day for, for a decade. And when I was, sometimes there were restrictions on my freedom. For example, I cannot leave my place. I cannot enjoy freedom of movement. So I decided to, to go to Thailand because there were many Burmese migrants in Thailand already by that time. And Thailand is a friendly country. What was that like? What were the working conditions? What were the living conditions like? And when did you start organizing again? I was working in Thailand. It's actually like hard to, to motivate workers to organize because they are usually like, when they arrive from Myanmar, they have not had any experience of like working or like, organizing. My grant workers are usually poor and they don't want to participate in uh, organizing. So I told them that we need to act collectively to, to win something. When I arrived in Thailand, I was 
an illegal migrant worker, so I cannot work in official large factory. I work in shrimp peeling shed with only 50 workers. But even though I work in a factory, I read news every day. I read about the minimum wage. I read about eight hour working hour and how much workers should get paid for overtime. After that, I contacted NGOs to get more information and talk to these 50 workers about our rights. Still, it was a hard effort to organize, but finally I can do it. Can you tell me more about how you found MWRN and decided to join their organizing efforts? Yeah, so MWRN was founded in 2009. MWRN had nine workers and it operated under the umbrella of Human Rights and Development Foundation or HRDF in Samusakon branch. At that time, MWN was not able to organize because workers were new and they are not strengthened enough. Then HRDF contacted me and asked me to work with them under the MWN project. And I wanted to continue to the struggle for for a union. I want to organize a union, not working with the NGO, but they convinced me just like, okay, to check how we can operate together. So I I decided that, okay, I will join the MWIN. No, 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 and the last one that I work with is one of the largest facilities called Kingfisher. And I started working at Kingfisher in 2006. And at that time, there were protests in Myanmar in 2006, 2007. So the protests in Myanmar actually like inspired workers who were not happy with the working condition and workers know that the company have breached the labor law. The worker decided to protest. I led the workers protest at Kingfisher in 2007. I am the fighter and I am the protest leader, so they engaged me. Because, you know, not all the workers would like to be leader. Not all workers would like to come up front, and I decided to come up front. So we discussed together how, ca how we can talk under this um, structure to organize workers and to strengthen them. So what happened? You led the protest, and, and then what happened? So... I identify 14 workers who are core leader to talk to workers in their production line. What are the problems and what workers want? And at Kingfisher, we work in the evening. So after work, all of the core team leader met at 8 p.m. We meet and talk and identify six issue for our collective bargaining in Burmese and then have this collective bargaining proposal translated in Thai. Then we send a letter requesting collective negotiation to the manager, but the manager ignored um, our request and the employer didn't know that workers preparing for collective bargaining. We decided to protest for one day. And after that, the, the management come back and ne negotiate the collective agreement with us. But we didn't protest during the first time, I sent the CBA first time in Thai and Burmese, and the management ignored it. Another three days, I sent another letter request for like collective negotiation, but they also ignored it. And so after the the second time, the third time, the whole factory protest. me, after we have won the first CBA, I studied the Thai labor law and the law said that if there are more than 50 workers in a workplace, there should be a welfare committee. So I was elected to be the um, president of the welfare committee. So I, I've won the election. 
the Thai trade union movement's embrace of migrant worker groups is significant. It's not always easy for native-born workers like Thai nationals, especially those already facing restrictive labor laws, to take on the migrant workers' struggles. But the Thai union movement has done just that, even challenging the government's treatment of migrant workers at the International Labor Organization, a case we discussed in our interview with Sawit Kawan. To learn more about restrictions on migrant worker organizing, check out Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum's 2019 report, Time for a Sea Change. It's posted on laborrights.org and in the resources section of this podcast. So you were organizing and bargaining, but as migrant workers in Thailand, you're not legally allowed to form a union. So how did you work around that? So I understand that Thailand has not ratified the ILO Convention 87 and 98. So I talked to workers that despite you cannot organize into a union, you can organize into groups. And if there are any union in your workplace, you can join Thai People's Union. Since 2007, I urge migrant workers to be a member of uh, a Thai trade union if there is any. And since Migrant workers also know that they cannot file a migrant worker-led union. They work around it by forming into like migrant workers group. And there are many groups of migrant workers in Thailand now, and we are now collaborating with the new Burmese government in exile to discuss about the workers issue in Thailand. Were you organizing unions when you were in Myanmar, or was your political activism in Myanmar different? I was like um, 20 something, like early 20 in Myanmar during the people uprising in 19. In 1988. I was working in the government. So when I joined the people's uprising, I was fired. So when I was unemployed, I was constantly under the military surveillance. I cannot go out. And I think like, okay, if I am under the military surveillance and I cannot travel, I cannot stay in Myanmar. That's why I left for Thailand. So I find it really impressive that you went from migrating, being illegal, learning this language, and then learning the law and educating workers. Can you remember a little bit about what that was like? I could not read or write Thai when I arrived in Thailand, but I want to understand the Thai law. So I go to NGO Resource Center. They organize meetings and training activities. Several NGO also have books or uh, leaflet, pamphlet translated from Thai to Burmese. And I go to the library every Sunday to read them. But still, now I cannot read Thai nor write Thai, but I can speak a bit. MWRN has been working mostly in the seafood sector, but I know you work broadly on migrant worker issues. Can you talk about how large MWRN is now in terms of members and explain a little about the model, how it works? Since 2009, we have in the UN, we have about over 10,000 members. But okay, this is the number in on the paper in, in our registration system. But the actual number may be less than 10,000 because sometimes workers relocated or they return to Myanmar. So the number of actual membership may be less than 10,000. MWIN is the member of TLSC, Thai Labor Solidarity Centers. So I go to the meeting every month. We have the problem with collecting trade union dues from MWIN members, and I was worried about it. But after I go to the CERC meeting, I also hear the same problem from Thai trade union. The, the problem is they have to collect the union dues by themselves because there's some workplace do not have check-off system. And then they cannot collect all the due, which is also the same problem apply for MWRN. And I think, okay, because like, even though 
Thai worker work in Thailand and they don't pay the union dues. And if migrant worker working in Thailand, they also have like lower wage and a lot of problems. If I cannot collect the dues from our member, it's okay. So, I don't know. I don't know. I started working with Thai Trade Union since I started working with MWN. Mostly I work with Sawit and Sawit said all workers are brothers regardless of the nationality, whether you are Thai or migrant workers. If you are workers, you are my brothers. So I decided to join the Thai Trade Union movement. It was approved four years ago. So now MWN is an official member of when Ong Cha explains the additional challenges to collecting dues and building a stable movement among workers living in precarious, often shifting situations, he highlights additional challenges in Thai labor law. Not only are migrant workers who make up the majority of the workforce in some sectors prohibited from forming and leading their own unions, there are also legal or administrative challenges to collecting members' dues, which further weaken the unions. Although significant funding has flowed into Thailand to support the NGOs working to provide critically needed services to migrant workers, few funders are yet set up to fund trade unions' movement building work, work that is often politically risky and may not follow a linear path to meeting predefined deliverables. MWRN effectively functions as a hybrid, collaborating with NGOs while clearly identifying as part of the broader trade union movement. Given Ong Cha's knack for tapping all resources available, I had to ask him about the different approaches to combating human trafficking and forced labor. So I have an interesting analysis that I wanted to ask for his opinion on. The question is, a lot of the NGOs are trying to work on migrant worker issues because they want to address forced labor and human trafficking. And there are a lot of organizations that document cases and try to solve cases, which is very important work for migrant workers in trouble. And then there are the unions, which are trying to build a movement. And it seems like there's a tension between addressing individual cases and building a movement. Does he see that tension and how does he view it? When I arrived in Thailand, there were many trafficking in person cases, but that first NGO did not want to touch this issue. So my grand workers, when they have organized into groups, they can pressure Thai government and Burmese government to work together to address trafficking in person issue. I think trafficking in person issue requires um, collaboration and also pressure from Thai, um, from Thai people, Myanmar workers and NGO to campaign to pressure for the government and address these problems. Currently, there are less trafficking in person cases because we engage the governments and multi stakeholders to work on this issue. And what about with the corporations? What, what does he think the responsibility is of the global corporations that are buying from the shrimp peeling sheds and the Thai fishing vessels? What does he think the international corporation responsibility should be? So currently CPF or Thai unions tap their measure against labor right abuses and forced labor and trafficking in person, but this may not reach through the smaller company if those smaller companies are in their supply chain. So I think in Thailand, in trade union, NGO, and the Thai Labor Ministry has been, have been collaborating well to address the trafficking in person. For buyers, I think buyers should use their network to verify and inspect products that they have purchased from buyers in Thailand. For example, they should like inspect um, the product and process from CPF or Thai Union. Part of what makes MWRN's approach unique is the way they've engaged large seafood companies in Thailand, such as CP Foods and Thai Union, which are among the world's leading shrimp processing companies. MWRN has worked publicly and privately and enlisted the large seafood buyers to open up space for their organizing and activism 
with the welfare committees operating in seafood processing facilities, such as the shrimp peeling sheds where Ang Cha first started organizing migrant workers. The companies invited MWRN organizers like Ang Cha to give workshops and interview migrant workers. MWRN was able to identify which workers were in debt bondage and to push the companies to pay off workers' debts and begin monitoring the labor recruiting agencies they used. Thanks to MWRN and other organizations supporting migrant workers, many groups now advocate what is known as the employer pays principle, where employers actively seek to pay off labor brokerage fees for the migrant workers they hire. This has helped alleviate some of migrant workers' debts, but it requires the support and vigilance from groups that migrant workers trust, like MWRN. Ung Cha, earlier you said that it's important for the NGOs and the government to work together to solve the problems with worker rights abuses, especially human trafficking and forced labor issues. How does that collaboration work and how would you like to see it improved? Governments want to address the labor rights abuse or trafficking in person. They need to genuinely engage Thai trade union and migrant workers group on mm. board. The Thai government need to implement the plan after discussion with the stakeholder. Earlier, I have noticed that the Ministry of Labor have many commitments that they cannot implement. I think that they should talk to trade union and migrant worker groups to identify issues and priority. Then the government really have to implement and address the problems. But I, and then the government work together with stakeholders to address the issues. But I disagree with just nominal representation of worker groups. You only engage two or three worker groups into the meeting, but in the end, you didn't do anything to address the problem. I should note Ang Cha's comments echo some of what we discussed in our first podcast with Sawit Kawan. The unions and migrant worker organizations want to engage the government on enforcement efforts to prevent abuses, but the government is not fully open to that collaboration. I spoke with Dave Welsh, the head of the Solidarity Center in Thailand, and he also emphasized that collaboration between these groups and the government is crucial. He noted that despite the Thai government sending some of the right signals, the resources are woefully inadequate and there is a lack of political will to prosecute forced labor cases, which continue to be endemic in Thailand. So how has COVID affected MWRN and the organizing that you're doing? I understand you recently had COVID. How are you feeling? In December 2009, we have faced the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, the office have followed the instruction of the governor not to gather more than five person, and we also used PPEs for our protection. It is um, prohibited to gather more than more than four. So the office have to close down many times just to follow this instruction. On the 1st August, I was tested positive. So I self-isolated at home and also go to, after that, I contact few hospital and I was admitted. So with the prohibition to gathers, we cannot organize any training and any meetings. So our staff use online media and online platform to reach workers. Have many of the workers returned to their countries and how are they living through the pandemic? I understand some of the migrant workers who are still in Thailand can't access health care or financial support and they are not all working. How's COVID affecting migrant workers in Thailand? I am Burmese government said in 2009 that there were 60,000 MOU workers who have returned to Myanmar and they cannot return back to Thailand to work. The problem with existing workers in Thailand is they cannot renew their work permit because their visa have expired. I have tried to contact with the Burmese government, but of course the political situation and the government is running in chaos. So they don't know what to do regarding the workers' visa and passport. 
On the 12th, I will talk to the new government in exile about this problem. Regarding the problem of corporate support for COVID, large companies are able to support workers if especially large export, exporting companies, for example, Thai Union, Unicorn, Kingfisher, etc. Workers are paid during the quarantine or if they are sick for the first for the for the first wave, workers are, are paid if even if they are not uh, working at at the first at the companies. For the second wave, the company provides services for workers and give information for workers to get fifty percent of the wage from social some from social security and employment benefit. But the problem is there are many small factories that can provide this kind of compensation or benefit for worker during the suspension of operation or when worker gets sick. MWRN try to negotiate on behalf of worker working in small and medium enterprise if they do not receive proper compensation or payment, but it is difficult because we cannot travel well. So I can just communicate with worker online and try to negotiate on that behalf, but it is difficult. This is the second time Ong Cha talks about how the coup in Myanmar has left migrant workers even more vulnerable during the pandemic. As we release this podcast, we should note it's been more than a year since the military took over in Myanmar. MWRN previously was beginning to organize in Myanmar's sender communities so that migrant workers would be better informed. That's not possible now. So the government does not guarantee support for migrant workers? So I think the Thai government do, uh, did not implement the policy that they have um, announced. I get complaints uh, from small and medium-sized factory and refer to relevant government agencies, but there are no political will to enforce the law and order, especially the case for small and medium enterprises. For large enterprises, uh, this is not problematic at all. They, they comply to, to the laws and, and regulation. When I reach out to government agency, they do not address the problem. And during the COVID, it is difficult to travel and meet and negotiate with the big person. So sometimes workers get the compensation that they, they are entitled, sometimes they did not. Does he have Anything else he wants to add? Any additional comments on how the international community can better support their work? So, and the BYN have been working officially with the HIDF, which is a registered Thai NGO. And we receive support from Solidarity Center for our organizing staff funding and organizing skill training. We also were, uh, received funding from the European Union and the U.S. Embassy, and they have been giving funding to support our organizing effort and technical and technical support. Now go. Thank you. From the support that I have received, I really appreciate international community, especially after the pandemic, to help. MWRN to recruit and maintain our staff to reach out and organize migrant workers because during the COVID, we do not have enough staff and resources to reach out for, for workers. Since um, 2009, MWRN have represent migrant workers who dare not want to collectively fight or openly like struggle for their rights. So I really appreciate if international community could, could contribute to our effort to reach out and help my grand workers. Thank you. Ong Cha, thank you so much for your time and for your commitment to workers. Your, your story is very moving, especially the way that you brought your political organizing from Myanmar and used it to organize workers in Thailand. I, Thank you for the work you do, and thank you for making time to speak with me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, I hope 
to see you one day in the U.S. and appreciate the time spending with you in Washington D.C. Yeah, thank you. I I hope you will come again. I hope I will see you in Thailand. คิดไปอยากจะมาหาหน้าองจอที่ไทยถ้าเกิดเดินทางได้ค่ะขอบคุณมากค่ะขอบคุณน้าจอวัดดีค่ะ Have a good day, Judy. Okay, thank you so much, Job. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you for listening. I hope Ang Cha's story provides new perspectives on migrant workers' struggles. International media and NGO campaigns play an important role in exposing forced labor, human trafficking, and the other ways migrant workers are abused. Yet coverage often focuses on rescue efforts, highlighting victim-centered solutions as opposed to power-building solutions. MWRN's organizing efforts in Thailand are about building migrant worker power and their ability to bargain collectively. To find out more about the Migrant Worker Rights Network, follow them on Facebook at MWRNORG. And to see pictures of Ang Cha and Sawit Kawan and other MWRN organizers like Sente and Andy Hall, visit accountabilityresearch.org. Slash worker rights or empathymedialab.com/laborlink. This podcast is a collaboration of the Accountability Research Center and Empathy Media Lab. To hear other great podcasts about worker rights, go to laborradionetwork.org. Thank you for listening.